Hello and welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to another Historical Humans podcast. My name's Justin Woods, and I'm joined today by my fellow co-hosts, Cullum Coleman and Aaron Gilpin. And today, we're doing something not quite the most historic, but something that we think is historic in nature. We're going to actually be talking about Steve Irwin and the Australia Zoo. So we're doing something on a more modern figure. Modern by our standards, but... Yeah. It was still something that we felt was important enough to talk about and someone who I think we all look up to. To be fair, he does still fall within the 50-year rule because he was older than 50 years old when he <laughs> passed away. Yeah, so the first 12 years of his life are considered historic. <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah, it's one of the fun things. Uh, there is a general 50-year rule that anything le- that is less than 50 years old is considered political and everything over that is considered historical. It's a line in the sand, and one which we are crossing for the first time this season. Uh, It's not the first time we've crossed this line on this channel, but it's the first time we're doing it this season. To be fair, I could also... Oh, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, I think this is the most we've crossed that line, too. To be fair, I would also argue that anything political could also be older than 50 years old. But why? But uh, for just an arbitrary sake, we're going to keep it at the 50-year rule anyway. We are going We are going to abide by the uh, U.S. standard for historic places. We are Americans. We are going to run with that. Yay. Just like we run with everything. Amerocentricism in an yeah. Australian episode. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> hey, no. He was so popular in this country. He, he was made an honorary we American, love I'm pretty Steve sure. Irwin, and yeah. we highly respect the work that was done because... There has been very few figures that have evaded controversy almost entirely, and he is someone who is honestly put on a mythological pedestal just based on the work that he's done for wildlife conservation. That man was part of my childhood. He is historic. The Four Horsemen of Wholesome. (laughs) Yep. Uh, Yeah, feeding feeding crocodiles with your baby. So Steve Steve Irwin is an Australia... Uh, he's an Australian. He lived from 1962 to 2006. And uh, his association with the animals of Australia began very early in his life. Uh, as he grew up uh, in the Berwa Reptile Park, which was a, uh, a rehabilitation center uh, for Australian reptiles set up by his parents. <laughs> Uh, so right away we have uh, Steve Irwin as the animal person. Uh, it is effectively in his blood uh, at this point. So you're saying he's second generation crocodile dude? Yes. Uh, uh, the Berwa Reptile Park uh, is what would eventually become known as the Australia Zoo. Uh, we will go into detail on this institution later in the episode. So if you're uh, if you're, in, if you're interested in that, uh, uh, be sure to stick around. It is one of the uh, one of the premier uh, conservation centers in the world. Oh yeah, yeah. So, uh, I'd say it's the largest, but then I'm sure someone in the internet who knows more will correct me. Um, well, actually, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, oh, oh, yep, yeah. here it is. The accent. <laughs> I pulled it up. I pulled it up on Google Maps. Oh, yeah. So, all right, Steve Irwin had a history working with animals, especially with his parents, but it, yeah, yeah. it was just laying the groundwork for him to take their work and expand upon it and grow it and just manifest it into this worldwide endeavor, which is yeah, honestly and it, incredible. And honestly, Steve Irwin's life is kind of the perfect storm of uh, conservation, because not only is he growing up at the... Uh, at the uh, Berwa Reptile Park, where he is helping rehabilitate, uh, you know, Australian reptiles. He also, uh, when he is young, Australia, uh, specifically, I believe, Queensland, uh, puts together what is known as the East Coast Crocodile Management Plan. Now, this is a government program to stop people from hunting crocodiles and killing them off. Uh, This plan came into being largely because the settlements in Australia were becoming more populous and thus they were clashing with the native uh, highly dangerous lizards far more often and the government wanted to rehome the crocodiles instead of kill them. So they almost went the way of Florida. I yeah. Well no, Florida instituted a 
a croc residency program where every Florida man was paired with a croc. This is a little. Are you different. telling me American crocodiles are legal U.S. citizens? Yeah, they're closer to it. Um, they're like exchange students. Yeah. But, uh, yes. Um, yes. Uh, this management plan, which is still in operation, uh, is designed to keep crocodiles out of out of towns in Queen, Queensland and to prevent people from having any excuse to ever hurt a crocodile uh, by moving them into the wilderness where they can safely thrive. I just want to point out here and also make a small plug yeah. that we talked about in the uh, Emu War. Australia <laughs> at this point had learned its its uh, lesson when it comes to large-scale management plans for quote-unquote aggressive species. So I think they weren't trying to have the same ramifications where they lost to a flightless bird. To be Crocodiles, fair, and that was... And that flightless bird wasn't even really a predator. This, these are predators. Yeah, so they're just like, no, 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 no. We learned our lesson, no. E emus are vicious, though. We uh, love them. They are. they are vicious. But I'm like, I look at this croc leather boot yeah. I made. Yeah. <laughs> I'm anyway, a really big so, fan of emu eggs. They're great yeah. for omelets. So, you can make like 10 so of them. Between, <laughs> between Burwa and the East Coast Crocodile Management Plan, um, Steve Irwin uh, began to capture crocodiles in the 1970s alongside his father, who, being in charge of a reptile rehabilitation center, was naturally involved in the acquisition of crocodiles and removing them from populated areas. Um, in, uh, I believe... 1971, at the age of nine, Steve Irwin personally wrangled his first crocodile. Jesus. He did this by charging it and leaping onto its backside, uh, a technique he would perfect much for much of his life. This man, yeah. like I, See, see, this man lived, like, this, see, a Florida man wouldn't do that. No. Yeah. yeah, they would jump him, but this man was doing it for a hug. At, the other at that guy, age, Florida man will stab it. I, or also, at that age, you become the meal. A nine-year-old yeah. trying to wrangle a croc. Yeah, he he does. Yeah, he does not have. At the, he successfully wrangles it at nine, uh, which is very impressive. You know, the fact that he does not have the weight to counterbalance any sort of thrashing that the croc might perform. It's like bull riding, but Australian. Yeah. <laughs> All right, we're the Australian Croc Riding League. Surprisingly, it's only twelve percent more fatal. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> I've been to rodeos. Yeah. Oh, no. uh, he, uh, as he grows up uh, into the nineteen eighties, as a teenager, he works for the program independently from his father. Uh, he and it's uh, at this time where he begins to spend several months at a time out in the Australian bush hunting the wildlife uh, for capture and release programs. Um, he was uh, very good. He earns a reputation as being a specialist in animals who have exhibited uh, dangerous behaviors, i.e. these are crocodiles that have already attacked people. And he proves to be a specialist in bringing those ones in unharmed. Jeez. So these are the problem cases, the basket yeah. cases. And they're like, we can't do it. Bring bring the guy yeah. in. You yeah. know the yeah. one. Like, bring him in. And then yeah. Steve Irwin with his high pulled up shorts. This, it comes this... up like, all righty. Oh, yeah. you're a beauty. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, everybody else is just like tried, like, had their, were at their limit. Here comes Steve Irwin. Just, just ready, big old smile. And he's just like, yeah. right, bud, what seems to be the problem? <laughs> oh, you gotta, you gotta. A sore tooth? Let me pull that right out for you. Yeah, how it's like he's just like now listen, and then he like tells everybody he's like, listen, see when he starts doing this, it turns out he just wants a glass of wine. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, uh, he uh, he, be he he becomes known uh, in the uh, within the uh, East Coast Management uh, Program as Australia's top croc catcher. He becomes known as like the best guy they have. Which is saying something, because you have about 20 years worth of Australians, you know, 
fighting crocodiles at this point, and he's considered number one. To be fair. He's not even an adult. To be fair, he's not fighting them. He's befriending them like a fucking anime character. Yeah. Um, it's like, listen, we, we don't have to fight. We can just be friends. We can do this the uh, easy way or we can do this the hard way. <laughs> I'm going to teach this crocodile the power of friendship. Oh, no. The, be the, the best part is you can tell already that everyone knew Steve Irwin was over the top. Because he had a habit of making, quote, training films by taking a tripod into the wilderness with him, <laughs> setting it up, and then having it film him uh, wrangle the croc. So you can always tell he's already that little bit extra. So <laughs> just, the, now I'm going to get him. <laughs> first wildlife vlogger. Yeah. Oh, my God. Imagine if this man had started life when TikTok was a thing. Like, the, the this, man is this is the new crocodile challenge. See if you can <laughs> jump on the back to wrangle him. Well, well, if he was if he was in the age of TikTok, we'd have probably about another decade of the crocodile hunter uh, straight to DVD for us. <laughs> I mean, at least his son, I like his son's still doing stuff, so that's good. I, I found his son's TikTok. Yeah. Oh, Robert's Robert's yeah. TikTok. If you guys yeah. haven't checked it out, there yeah. him him and his sister Bindi continue Steve's work, and they're incredible people. But yeah. We'll get to that but, later. Yes. But we're in the '80s right now. They don't exist yet. <laughs> Just a twinkle of a twinkle of a spark. No, nope, we haven't even met Mrs. Irwin because uh, <laughs> that is in fact uh, one of our next things. Uh, in 1991, uh, his parents decide that it is time to bring uh, little Steve back home here, uh, you know, and uh, they uh, they give him what is the Australian Zoo. Uh, he takes over from his father, and he changes the name to the Queensland Reptile and Fauna Park. Uh the zoo itself, uh, this this new park, uh, you know, that he's inherited, is has been one of the primary hubs for most of the crocodiles that uh, Steve Irwin wrangled over the course of his life. Uh, this is where he sends them to before they are shipped out by the uh, East Coast Management Program. Yep, yep, I found it. I found Irwin Road. No. I've been looking at Google Maps trying to find me the zoo, and I found Irwin Road. Yeah. Noise. You know, if you usually just Google it, it'll give you the location. That's no fun. He's got to do. He's got to do a reverse geo guesser. Oh jeez. Yes. <laughs> also, I did originally find it that way, but then I lost it, and now I'm too stubborn to, to type it back in again. Yeah. All right, Captain Cook. Uh, anyways. Anyway, uh, oh yeah, he died today. Yeah. Yeah. Ninety one uh, is also the year where he meets uh, Terry Rains. Now. Terry uh, is the future Mrs. Irwin, uh, but at the time she was an American tourist who was visiting the Queensland Reptile and Fauna Park. Uh, it so happened that while she was visiting the park, she got to witness one of Steve Irwin's crocodile feedings, also known as a man of khakis walks into the water with a bucket of meat. Not to mention high-rise khaki shorts. Yeah. God. The standards for men used to be so high. <laughs> <laughs> now all they know how to do is just podcast, yeah. and drink Diet Coke, and yeah. play video games. Yeah. Uh, their connection was instant, and by 1992, they had married. Uh, Sheesh. Yeah. Any ideas what they did for their honeymoon? At least uh, they went crocodile hunting. Uh, I, I hope they recorded crocodile hunting. They filmed the first ever uh, crocodile hunters, what they did. They went out and filmed Steve Irwin uh, hunting crocodiles and made the first ever episode of Crocodile Hunter. Oh, even better. Beautiful. That's a that's yeah. a true, like, power couple. If she not only supports your ambitions, but helps you achieve success. Yeah. He found somebody crazy enough to do it with him with his life, and that's all we could yeah. dream for. Right. Yep. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the two children they do have uh, are Bindi and Robert. Uh, they will be coming up, I believe, uh, in bits and pieces later on. Uh, but, you know, for the most part, we're going to take a little divergent here into his television career uh, as we go into Crocodile Hunter. Ooh. Crocodile Hunter um, originally aired 
on Australian TV in 1992. The first episode was a single 10-hour documentary. So for people out there who complain that movies are too long these days, I give you this. A 10-hour documentary. Hey, the, ten hour, the ten hours would like to know Jackie's your hunting a crocodile. It just, you could tell he had a pretty good natural charisma to him whenever he was talking about it. And I think this is something that's true for Steve Irwin, but also resonates with a lot of other people when they talk about things they're very passionate about. Is like that passion translates over the camera and translates into the hearts of people. Like just his pure excitement for these animals, for these crocodiles, like you can feel it. Yeah. Yeah, you, you can tell he's in love with uh, the world around him. Uh, specifically, all the things in it that are trying to kill him. <laughs> that's, the, that's the thing. I feel like he just helped bring, like, a special attention to a lot of animals that are extremely dangerous. Like, I feel like if there wouldn't be such a sensation around crocodiles or even alligators, too, or just reptiles in general without him. Like, no one, no one wants an alligator stuffed plushie without think you know like no one thinks like that normally yeah. now but now they do I guess <laughs> normally it's like normally however Steve Irwin exists yeah um, Steve Irwin exists no, and uh, now we all love crocodiles yeah. the four no, horsemen of wholesome I'm telling you him Bob Ross Mister yeah. Rogers Who's yeah the they one? each have to ride in on something iconic to them so Steve Irwin is riding in on a giant crocodile. <laughs> Oh, no. Bob Ross is on a painting of a tree in the background. <laughs> yeah. uh, don't be ridiculous. Bob Ross would never put a person in his paintings. <laughs> but uh, anyway, the show, uh, the original 10-hour documentary, was such an immediate success that Australia's Channel 10 uh, immediately hired uh, the Irwins to make several other documentaries for them. Uh, Beautiful. People really watched all oh. Probably yeah. not all 10 hours, but, like, they watch. Wow. Yeah. Uh, th you know, this is the early 90s, all right? Television is weird. Yeah, let's it's, be honest. They didn't it's have... Just, it's, it's just settling down into the, like, major market media stuff that we have today. It's just finally starting to shake into those boxes. That, that was, was also true. a time period that people would sit down for long periods and watch the same program. It's not like today where people are like, oh, my 30-second video is over. On to the next 15. Yeah. Yeah, That's yeah. Fair. the The whole like TV show quote marathons that are sometimes put on today is effectively what would count as like single episode blocks back then. <laughs> so you are expected to watch, you know, a four hour movie of something, and that be your time slot. I guess people do watch the news. They used to like, I guess maybe not so much now, but they used to like watch the news all day because you watch like the news channel and like yeah, they have like different like show like shows i guess blocked off you know for time slots but i guess it's still technically just the same show all day congratulations boys you have discovered a cultural genesis moment would you like to continue or would you like to stop here revert 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 <laughs> we need to go back return to monkey when you put return to monkey oh, oh, later this season <laughs> We Put will that be doing that shirt. later this season, won't we? Yep. I, want it. I want that. Yeah. Along with Neolithic sex cult, I haven't forgotten. Oh, for, uh, I was kind of hoping you would. Yeah, <laughs> I, I will that. never forget. I will always hope. Uh, anyway, the Crocodile Hunter show was picked up by Animal Planet in 1996. This is when it becomes standardized because it has now been acquired by an American conglomerate. Uh, uh, and it airs uh, from 97 to 04 with a total of 68 episodes across eight seasons. Uh, and it airs in over 200 countries uh, at its peak. Which, eight seasons? That's quite yeah, a bit. Which is hugely impressive for someone filming a mega documentary for literally, like, local Australian television. Man hit it big. Yeah. Uh, the show itself, for people who might not know, uh, was... Uh, based on Steve's exploits in Australia, and it steadily expanded to include him going to other continents like Asia and Africa and interacting with their wildlife. The primary purpose was to 
showcase uh, animals, specifically dangerous animals, and get people interested in them and invested in keeping them uh, alive, in conserving them. Uh, because just because something is scary or dangerous doesn't mean that it is bad or that we should destroy it. And I that is... I think most you Americans know, like, would like to talk to you on that one. Yeah. And that was Steve Irwin's life goal, was to show people that these dangerous animals are also fascinating and beautiful. Um, his general... Um, his, his general uh, beliefs and effectively... Uh, mission statement was that education was about being uh, uh, meant you were excited about something that was when you learned so if he could make you as excited as he was to go and see these animals then he was doing his job and if you wanted to see these animals then you would also want to help save them because most of the animals that steve Irwin features on his show the crocodile hunter were endangered as well as dangerous and, you know, that, you know, fulfills the dual purpose of these are the things that need our help the most. Yes, they can try to eat you, but that doesn't mean we should be want we should be trying to get rid of them. Which does kind of make sense in the fact that, like, we have, it, like, I'm always, I'm always very much, like, kind of pro uh, predator reintroduction into natural habitats since like, they are like, an essential part to the ecosystem but um, we don't you, you have to see a lot of pushback when it comes to like wanting to see uh, predator conservation because especially from trophy hunters specifically because um, you know they want they want the animal pelts they want to have, that's their hobby I guess you know um but you don't see a lot of love for predators, especially for things like crocodiles. Other than I guess like some something that looks like we could, we want a pet like yeah. wolves and well, bears. That, well, that, that's that's the things like there's that there's a uh, I think there's the false dichotomy of nature that uh, we as humans tend to create where uh, things in nature are either you know cute, fluffy, happy things in their you know in their kind forest that are adorable and harmless or literal bloodthirsty monsters like the xenomorph from Alien, and there's no in-between. There is no thing that is predator, but is also nice. Yeah, to be there fair, is... if I saw a crocodile and I was in the middle of a swamp, I would think, I would like all of those things to never be around me. I would begin by questioning why I was in a swamp. It's humans. How do we end up anywhere? We just kind I don't of know. wander in. I live, on, I live on the edge of a marsh out here, so... <laughs> Hey, let's way. let's use positive wetland languages. We're not using anti wetlands rhetoric. No, 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 no one hundred one hundred percent. The name the name of where I of where I am. I'm on the border of what is literally named a marsh. That is the yeah. actual name of the place. I I grew up. I'm on not going to say marsh which marsh because I'm not doxing myself. But I grew up near a marsh. <laughs> I live on a marsh. They're great. Wait, I didn't know, guys. I didn't know either one of you are from DC. Hashtag drain the swamp. Ah! All right, Paula. All right, all right. This is why this is, and this is why the fifty-year line exists. Uh, it should be for Justin's comments, but it's not. Oh, I love see, it. See, you can stop it for the video topics, but you can't stop it for the jokes. Oh, oh this is yeah. Oh Lord, I don't have a sensor button, and this is why. <laughs> I just oh said, wait, I got one. No, Aaron, Aaron, no, no, bad, no, bad. no. That's not a sensor button. That's that's a demonetization button. You know it. Instant. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, uh, moving on from 1997, uh, uh, Steve Irwin uh, with his show and with the other work that he did as uh, you know, effectively running the Australia Zoo. Uh, in 97, he discovers a uh, new turtle species. Uh, the species is named for him in both uh, the common name and in the uh, tax, uh, the taxonomy name. Hmm. Uh, it, is, it is known today as Irwin's turtle or uh, Elsea Irwini. Uh... It is the Irwini turtle. <laughs> I think that more than anything is the true like honor. Yeah. When someone goes, all right, we're gonna name this after you because they you don't 
change the name of a of a species, especially the yeah. taxonomical oh. name. I'd rather oh, have well, an animal did, named after me the rather than a they disease. Did, they, they didn't change the name of the turtle. They didn't know this turtle existed. <laughs> oh, turtle. I'm aware. Steve Irwin was the first human being to find one. <laughs> this man. I mean, I guess if it was anybody, it'd be him. So that should be the takeaway lesson here is if you want to make a name for yourself, discover a new species and name it after yourself because they can't take that back. <laughs> yeah, no. Or you get into conservation, get a, get a, become really passionate about it, and also just be a good person, yeah. and then get a zoo, start a conservation effort with the zoo, and then go out looking for animals, and then you might find yourself like a... Not you know, to mention marry an American or, woman. That seemed to be an important part yeah. of this, because she was oh. down for the wild. Oh, yeah. yeah. Find, a, find a spouse that uh, will fuel your madness. Which... Yeah. I, I know we mentioned her briefly, but that's one of the things I love about Steve's daughter, Bindi, is her husband, Chandler, is an American that was visiting Australia Zoo. Ah, uh, yes. The old, the old Irwin thirst yeah. trap. <laughs> they come the to zoo us. strikes again! Yeah. <laughs> and the best part is... He's just like Terry in that just fully jumped into the madness and now works as a conservator at the zoo. This man is just like, he's just like, he ran into Bindi and then they was just like, just like, do you like animal conversa- conservation? Yes. I do now, yeah. <laughs> it, it, it's like, uh, it's like the Irwins made some sort of dark pact with Australia where they would run this zoo that like saves all its animals and in return it would create successive generations of Irwins. I don't know if that sounds like a dark in. pact. That sounds like <laughs> the, just, the holy pact. It sustain three generations of Irwins. Okay, but this this is like the opposite of a devil contract in that like this is a a blessed zone. This is a holy zone, where it's just like anyone who who bathes in these waters shall be blessed with the Irwin. Are you gift. telling me? Are you telling me the Australian Zoo is a holy site? Yes. <laughs> I don't know. It has nature overtones. I'm Catholic. I'm pretty sure that means it's cursed. <laughs> Dark magic. <laughs> But enough of that aside. Uh, so at this point, we're starting to get into the 2000s. Irwin is uh, about to turn 40. Uh, so naturally, he is starting to get all the Lifetime Achievement Awards. Uh, everywhere. Yeah. Uh, to kick these off is the 2001 Australian Government Centenary Medal, which he receives as an award uh, for his service to both Australian conservation with his... Uh, work as a you know crocodile wrangler and to australian tourism with his work in the australian zoo and as the crocodile hunter on tv oh absolutely I mean, he, so he basically his his face his get up his personality is effectively uh the stereotype of what all outsiders think australians are so i, I can tell you firsthand that steve Irwin was my first introduction into australia existing same One. And then two, I've looked into traveling to Australia, and one of the things that I am going to see when I go there is the Australia Zoo. So not an if, when. Yeah, Watch exactly. Australia. Exactly. Yeah. So it's like, yeah, it's still it paying just... ramifications almost thirty years later. Yeah. So when do we all go to Australia? HH travels. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> we are never making to Australia. Uh, you guys gotta give me die. health insurance first, anyway. I would so. die. <laughs> I would too, but like with health insurance, I could be fine. Actually, wait, Australia has a like free health insurance. Aaron, Let's go, Aaron. I was also gonna say you work for an American corporation. Benefits. <laughs> yeah, <Yay. laughs> corporation. Yep. Oh God, I've gone corporate. <laughs> Sell <laughs> out. Me. Fuck it up. <laughs> <laughs> The second, uh, the second big thing uh, that comes up here for the 2000s is the very next year in 2002, uh, he founds what is known as Wildlife Warriors Worldwide. This is an international nonprofit charity dedicated to wildlife, con- wildlife conservation. Uh, it, its duty is to perform animal rescues and ecological research projects. 
Uh, it's still in operation today. Uh, we will get to talk about one of their big projects uh, um, a little bit later uh, that they take on uh, in the wake of Steve Irwin's death. Oh, spoiler alert. We already said he died in 06, Justin. That was the opening of this video. <laughs> You're killing me, Smalls. Yep. And now we're getting close because we're in 02. Um, and uh, speaking of 06, uh, in 2006, the same year that he unfortunately does pass, uh, he received an honorary professorship uh, by the University of Queensland School of Integrative Biology. That's right. He became a professor of biology. I I mean I feel like he kind of he's kind of got the hands-on experience. Yeah, I was yeah. Uh, also gonna say like, does he have a formal education in this? His education was his father taking him on crocodile hunts. What more like? What better way to learn about nature than by throwing yourself into nature? You're something. <laughs> and also, yeah. is this what they mean when they want 25 years of experience by, like, 20? <laughs> Probably. In that case, uh, in that I have case, found I got no 20, evidence that... I got 23 I experiences no on a horse. I ever set foot inside a school, so... This so, bit. yeah. Dead. I Rick would trust that don't need a formal education to still make a difference, which I think is a uh, is yeah. all jokes aside, education is very important and valuable, but it's not the single most limiting factor. However, being born to a family that owns a zoo also helps with that. Yeah. Now kids, go outside and go try to wrestle a crocodile. Uh, no. Don't listen to Aaron. That's advice no. for now. That was, for legal Steve, reasons. That's a Steve, joke for legal Steve reasons. Irwin was true. trained by a professional, his father. <laughs> I don't you think... Know someone who is already a certified crocodile wrangler, do not attempt. See, I just got yelled at for holding the flashlight. I can't imagine the type of yelling that happens at a crocodile wrangling. Now, yeah. Nar, Steve, you need to grab him. What? Not that arm. The Nar, other Steve, arm. the other arm. Yeah. Now give him a full Nelson. <laughs> <laughs> They're just, you know, his parents had six kids, named them all Steve, and 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 our Steve is the one that survives the crocodile wrangling. The Steve, greatest watch, Steve. Watch out, he's gonna steal chat. Oh you no, know, it's from the stop road. It's a crocodile with a steel chat. <laughs> Don't want to go the way of Steve Four. Oh <laughs> no, the one was messy. He, he never saw that chair coming. Oh, jeez. Yeah. RK uh, out of nowhere. <laughs> yeah. I feel like Steve, did Steve Irwin ever do a, like a WWE appearance? I feel like, because he's called like the Crocodile Hunter and he like jokingly wrestles them. I feel like they would have had him in a WWE match. No, but I, I guarantee you in just about every WWE video game, someone has made a character that looks like him. Oh, I don't doubt it. Um, I know that they have done cross promotion with them. Where they've oh, okay. had ra wrestlers uh, hold a bunch of animals and everything. And I believe they actually visited his family post-mortem. Oh, okay. Yeah. Kind of interesting. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, never seen him in the ring. Okay. Uh, speaking of post-mortem, the mortem. Um, <laughs> um, uh, um. Yeah, that, that is unfortunately our next section here, uh, which is... Uh, his death in 2006 uh, came about following a snorkeling accident, of all things. Uh, he was in the process of filming a documentary called Ocean's Deadliest near the Great Barrier Reef, uh, during which time, uh, while he was uh, gathering footage and sort of going over uh, talking about a bull stingray, uh, he swam over it in shallow water. Uh, now, this has a chance... To provoke the stingray, uh, it doesn't always do so, and at this instant, the stingray was spooked by his shadow, resulting in it stinging him across his chest. Um, uh, in fact, some of the reports I, I say claim that the barb from the stingray actually managed to strike his heart. I, I've heard that too. But yeah. I, I, but again, I never really Is knew. Yeah. I know there was footage of it, but that footage has been since destroyed. Yeah. Which, um, for good reason. Understandable. Yeah. 
he uh, did not die from the blow itself, but from the ensuing cardiac arrest brought on by the uh, stinger of the stingray, because those things aren't just little whips. Those are barbed. They are lethal. They are all sorts of things, and a bull stingray is massive. I, I, I will say to the Irwin family's credit, despite this tragedy of a situation, one of their main um, points for actually getting rid of that footage of his death was both out of respect for Steve, but also they didn't want it to look negative on the Stingrays. They didn't want a bad impression to be had, and in doing so, they tried to protect it even after his death, because despite everything that happened, they still took his his passion and, you know projected that i mean it makes sense because i mean like look what happens to sharks all the time after another shark attack movie comes out jaws fueled so many shark fears and led to them being demonized to the point where no one bats an eye about the culling of sharks even though like for the most part they leave you alone Cows are more likely. I was going to say, more people die to bovine accidents than they do shark attacks. I I think more people die to bees. Exactly. Like, more. If that. Vending machines. If people had seen. If that footage had ever gotten out, I feel like people would be okay. Would have been okay with, like, a mass calling of stingrays, which are also related to sharks. Yeah. Can can you imagine the uh, Steve Irwin memorial stingray hunt? Yeah. Oh no! Like, that like been... talk about like talk 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 about like worst possible outcome. And also, like Steve, it makes sense. Also, in another aspect that you know, Steve was always well aware he was in their home. Yeah. Like you. Yeah. That, yeah, you, yeah. You look at any episode of Crocodile Hunter, and he is immediately going, "I don't want to scare this thing. I'm not where I should be. Do not follow me. Uh, if this thing reacts violently, it has every right to." Uh, imagine right. someone broke into your house and tried to grab you. <laughs> right, like, I mean, even people don't, a lot of people just really don't understand that these are, like, wild animals are not the same as the pets you have. They, you can't just walk up and pet one. Can I pet that you, dog? Can I pet that dog? I mean, like, come on. Yeah, like, that's a that's a perfect example where... People see bears and they go, if not friend, then why friend shaped? Like, I get it. I want to pet them too. But also, I'm well aware that bear does not know I'm probably there. Which is why they also say make noise in the woods so the bear knows you're there and doesn't doesn't get spooked by you. Which is why it's great to be an American while hiking. You know, you just play your music. You just go dancing, screaming. You know, if you if you bring someone with you, you know, just make sure you have an exit plan to leave alone. There's there's also the same people who are the make sure you're faster. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah, just bring someone slower. Like those people are the reason why Yellowstone has signs that says "Do not pet the bison." Oh, I love the bison toss every year. Tourists that come to America and come to the national parks get too close to bison. And think that they can pet them because they look fluffy. And, and these they're... bison will toss the tourists like 10 to 15 feet in the air. Listen, yeah. they may eat grass, but they will turn your ass to grass. Yeah, listen, listen, like, listen, a, a, a full, you know, a, a deer can survive an impact with your car and walk away. A I've bison can chuck a deer uh, the same way you might throw a football. So <laughs> I've let's seen, not pretend it's just something to, li- to to take around. With. I was in a truck once when we got when we hit a deer, and the deer literally rolled over the truck, oh, out into the like the bed and flipped out, and still got back up and ran. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it, it's just safe to say that these animals. While the human nature is to try and go and pet and interact with the animal, a lot of them do pose a danger. And Steve was hyper acutely aware of the inherent risks and dangers. But that was part of his educational technique was to show that these super dangerous, maybe not the most well-known or most well-understood creatures also have an important value and a soft spot. And I think that's something that 
the Australia Zoo specifically, one of his legacy projects, really helps highlight because the zoo, you can go and you can watch a crocodile feeding the same way Steve did. I mean, there's great videos of Robert and Steve side by side flinging meat to the crocs, making them jump, and it's like the perfect comparison. Like, there's a lot of great educational tools to be learned from these animals, and it also helps, too, if we understand their mannerisms, their behaviors, we can understand how to work with them and how to avoid impact. Yeah, Yeah, the idea that the, the primary purpose of his life is to spread the idea that dangerous does not mean monster. Steve did all that so you didn't have to. He had just a unique set of skills... And he used them to show us, like, the world can't, like, these these animals, yeah, can be scary. But they also are just living their life. Yeah. And uh, speaking of animals living, uh, just living their life, um, in 2007, uh, just a year after his death, um, the Steve Irwin Wildlife Reserve in Cape York uh, is established in his honor. Uh, now, what this is, is it a 344,000 acre wildlife preserve containing 35 different ecosystems. Um, this place was Steve Irwin's uh, favorite place to go when he was alive. It was his favorite place on Earth. And after his death, it, is, it was made into a wildlife preserve. Um one of the ecosystems here is what is known as the Perched Bauxite Springs, which is an acidic waterway that is found nowhere else on Earth. Mm-hmm. Um, where, where is the, that at? Uh, it is uh, in Cape York. Uh, it's a part of Queensland, I believe. Australia, mate. Yeah. Uh, what's, oh, funny okay. is, found it. what's funny is that the waters in Perched Bauxite should be lethal to any form of life, yet it is a vibrant and diverse ecosystem. Nothing should be able to live in these waters, but they do. Gee, it's almost like life finds a way. Yeah, if this if this is the place that I'm thinking, I think I saw. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, because like this is where like the salt and freshwater meets, right? Where like the salination levels are all over the place. Yeah. Yeah, it's effective. Yeah, it's 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 yeah, it's it's high salination, except it's almost a river, uh, instead of being the usual like mesh point uh, between you know fresh and salt water. It's actually like a running river. Yeah, it's really weird, but it's also it's really, really it's cool. like the geography does something here that just doesn't do anywhere else in the world. Yep, I yeah, uh, it's it's yeah. for those of you who you know just didn't look it up, um, but. It's like at the tip of Queensland. Yeah. Uh, it is also home to an absurd number of crocodiles, which uh, really lends itself to why Steve Irwin kept coming here. <laughs> you think the crocodile? You think the crocodiles had a love hate relationship with Steve? Was like, like, oh like, god, here he comes again. <laughs> it's, I guess it's the annual. It's the annual Steve hugging. I guess. All right, yep. Jerry, it's your turn. I- I imagine I imagine it's like an Olympic sport for them where like one day there will come the crocodile that will overthrow this like you know menace to their society. Oh, no. The chosen one who shall become <laughs> the king chosen. of the crocodiles. Oh my god. You think you think they it was like a like an Olympic event where they like see how long can we avoid Steve before he hugs us? <laughs> can we croc- take him? <laughs> yeah, the, can we take him down in your wrestling match? <laughs> yeah. Um uh However, uh, one of the some of the very interesting things about this is um, days after it was announced, uh, there was a num there was a mining company that threatened to destroy the entire thing. Uh, of course, they, basically by strip mining the borders of this ecosystem and allowing all the industrial waste to run off into it. Lovely. Oh my god! Uh, you know the freshly widowed Mrs. Irwin. Took great offense to this, understandable, and proceeded to tr- and proceeded to fight a six-year legal battle to save it. That ended with a 2013 decision uh, to make it a strategic environmental area. Now, what this means is that uh, the Steve 
Irwin Wildlife Reserve has more legal protection surrounding it and its surrounding territories than the Great Barrier Reef does. Wow. The Great Barrier Reef is an icon of Australia. It is where Steve Irwin died. It is one of the main tourist attractions for the entire continent. And this place is more fiercely defended than that. To be fair, there's active threats to this uh, aspect, and it's a lot easier to have these protections on terrestrial uh, mm -hmm. places versus, you know, subaquatic. Yeah, yeah, the, the be... uh, yeah the the waterways are much harder to manage. Than but that's would. incredible, and that that unfortunately is a battle that a lot of people, environmentalists, have fought across the world of stopping these horrific, horrific um, mineral and material extraction companies, these mining companies, these loggers, from yeah. coming in and just destroying an ecosystem because. Yeah, and they go full scorched earth, you know. If you strip mine, you cannot salvage that land. Let, and, let, as and as archaeologists, we can tell you that once you dig up a bunch of dirt, you can't put it back the same way that yeah. you found it. Yeah. It's and always it, changed. Forever. The thing too is, it's an Australian mining company, and the Australian mining companies uh, do have a major history of ignoring uh, regulations whenever they can. Um. Specifically, oh, yeah, regulations episode. around the protection of environmental and cultural assets. Australia mining is also an episode topic we've considered. Yeah. Yes, but we don't want to traumatize <laughs> our viewers. Uh, yeah, yeah, we we're struggle. Fun this episode. Yeah, this is like we needed this because the topics that we have covered this year and this season are going to put our lovely uh, research and development department on suicide. I, 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 uh, no, they will not. No, they will, they will not put me there. You cannot put me where I already am. <laughs> no. I Jesus! Kid, I kid everybody. Uh, Justin, we have used our one use of the S word, of the S word for this entire season, so... Uh, Worth it. <laughs> bella ciao. Bella ciao, uh, bella ciao, bella ciao. Anyway. self arriving uh, um, aside. Yep. The... The uh, the season. The, the Steve Irwin Wildlife Reserve is currently uh, in use for major ecological resource uh, research. This research is primarily undertaken by the Wildlife Warriors, uh, Steve Irwin's nonprofit uh, conservation group. Uh, oh, so this is this is one of their note. main projects is studying these places. Uh, just a quick side note: if you haven't. Go to Google and look up Cape York or Cape York because these photos are insane, man. Like yeah. this is like, yeah, this is. is a, I can see more than like. Obviously, Steve like went like going there because of all the crocodiles, but like also he had to have gone there for like this view. Yeah. yeah, the, yeah, the um, yeah, we are not sponsored by anything that we are talking about here today. Uh, this is you know this is just genuinely our opinions on the matter and. Also, go visit your state deep. parks. Which, if the Australian government, for whatever reason, sees us and would like to sponsor a trip for us to go visit this in person, Please, for the love of God, we would sell our souls. <laughs> sell Justice. Yeah. I, oh, mine's already been accounted for. Sorry, boys. Yeah. I like this little emo. Uh, so, yes. In, in addition to all this work that he does, that he did in life, and. Uh, um, even like with his death, uh, effectively the ghost of Steve Irwin, uh, saving this, uh, you know, wildlife reserve, saving all these ecosystems. He's received a number of other, uh, posthumous honors, some of which are quite funny. Uh, my personal favorite was that in 2009, a new species of land snail was named after him. Oh, uh, yeah. the scientific name given to the snail is crikey Steve Irwini. Because Steve Irwin on Crocodile Hunter, fun fact, Crikey was his catchphrase, and he is the man who has forever linked that with the concept of anything Australian. Crikey. Especially the American zeitgeist. Yeah, yeah. You say Crikey and people think Steve Irwin. And Australia. Like, it's both. It's... Steve Irwin just is Australia. You just go to Australia, it's just Steve Irwin's face. I was I was shocked he wasn't the first president of Australia, to be honest with you. Right. I, I thought he just discovered Australia and like 
It's more like Australia spawned into existence around him, like a Minecraft world. Yeah. Now, does that come with the convicts, or is that later on? Is that like the villages you come across? <laughs> it's just a convict camp. <laughs> Wait, Justin, we haven't done the penal colonies episode yet. Spoilers. Oh, no. Oh, no. That's, that's not that's not happened yet. <laughs> yes. We have so many things to do. <laughs> Uh, if you want to give us ideas for what else we could do, throw them in the comments. Please, oh, please help these people. We need we need ideas they don't have. Less depressing ones, Good apparently. Or more ideas. depressing. Yeah. He uh, received the Queensland Greats Award in 2015, and in 2018 he received a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Um. Uh. Or rightly earned. I'm yeah, surprised which, he didn't have one earlier. Yeah, which is really impressive. 14 years after your like TV show goes off the air, you receive a, a Hollywood star. I think it ends up taking a while for like them to actually get around to doing that stuff. I'm not sure why, though. It's a bureaucratic thing. <laughs> Go figure. And a popularity contest, and a yeah, it's it's, it's like a, it's like the baseball Hall of Fame. Everyone in it has been retired for years. Or like the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, where they and now they've just started adding uh, other musicians. Oh my God! The Rock. If you really want to open up a rabbit hole, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame is the most like political biased organization. It, uh, to the point where it just it's it's an embarrassment. Is I'm that cool. older than fifty years old. You just, you just say that because they rejected you, Justin. No, it's there's actually a really interesting history, and maybe it's something we do a shorter dive on, but Hold it's on. pretty well known that it's a private organization. Mm -hmm. it's, not a pub, it's not a public or non-profit, but that's a completely different thing. I can rant about that all day. Anyway. Yes, rock and roll aside, uh, I think it's time, uh, ladies and gentlemen, for what we promised at the beginning of this episode, which is a closer look at the history of the Australia Zoo. Because uh, we've gone through Steve Irwin's life, we've talked about some of his posthumous achievements, a lot of the things he did with his life, and uh, and all that uh, all that good stuff. We've we've covered we've covered most of uh, most of his life. It's only forty year, forty one years old, Justin. Sorry. Yeah, that's yeah. fine. Yeah. Ten more years and we can cover. <laughs> so, <laughs> the Australia Zoo was originally established in 1970 as the Berwa Reptile Park. At its founding, it was a two-acre wildlife conservation park in Queensland, uh, and its purpose was simply to rehabilitate the local Australian wildlife. Uh, its founders were Bob and Lynn Irwin, Steve Irwin's parents, and it cared for basically anything that was indigenous to Australia that needed help. Uh, koalas, tigers, uh, or sorry, tiger snakes, crocodiles, and kangaroos. I always, I always want to put a comment in there, but yeah, there's something called a tiger snake in Australia, which uh, we don't need to start adding predators to other predators to make them look, you know, more fearsome. It's just Australia. Everything there can and will kill you, except for volcanoes. To be fair, yeah, isn't like Australia supposed to be God's like leftovers? <laughs> <laughs> Together. No, that was the Galapagos, I thought. I mean, nah. we've got all these extra spiders and snakes and... What do I do with the rest of these marsupials? Ah, eh, throw them in Australia. Wait, I have an idea for one that has a bill. I like it. <laughs> actually, fun fact, fun fact. I did actually learn this. South America actually has a, the most number of marsupial species. Parry the marsupial. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Wait, no, Careful, he's a platinum. That, that, oh. That's, that, that's <laughs> Aaron's thing. mind has oh. been blown. <laughs> yeah. Hold on a uh, second. <laughs> yeah, one, yeah, one legitimate corporation later. <laughs> I got, I've got hey, Google. Hey, Doofy Schmertz Incorporated is not going to sue us. <laughs> no, but their parent company might. <laughs> uh, yeah, we'll we'll go to the mouth at some All other right. time. Yeah. Uh. Uh, in the uh, 80s, it was rebanded as the Queensland Reptile and Fauna Park, where it doubled in size to four whole acres. They're not marsupials. Uh, they're monotremes. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, so it doubled in size, which is interesting knowing their current size. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It, it, it definitely snowballs. Uh, 
<laughs> it definitely snowballed. Uh, exponential growth. Yeah. Uh, during this period, it housed 100 crocodiles that were taken in during the East Coast uh, Crocodile Management Program. Uh, basically, these are the 100 crocodiles that Steve Irwin captured during his 10 years, uh, you know, basically during this decade. His 10 years of terror. <laughs> his 10 years traveling the countryside. Uh, it is also during this period where they took in their famous Galapagos tortoise of Harriet. Oh! Harriet? Yeah. As in Harriet up, you turtle. <laughs> yeah. Boo. Ah, ah, ah. You, you knew a bad pun was coming the second you focused on the name. The thing is, I'm the pun guy, all right? Yeah, no, you're not. Uh, it is also at this time in the 80s that it hires its first two full-time employees. It is no longer literally just the Irwins running everything. There's only so many crocodiles Steve could have actually wrestled at once. Yeah. I just, I in my head canon, I just imagine that Steve just kept coming home with more crocodiles and his parents were like, God damn it, Steve, we have nowhere to put them. And then when he got married, they're they're just like, it's your problem now, Terry. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. They're, they're, they're just slowly hosting interventions while the number of crocodiles slowly grows around them. <laughs> because he keeps bringing a crocodile to each intervention. <laughs> Yeah. See, uh, see, parents have to deal with kids bringing home a stray cat or poppy that they found. Not Steve's parents. They had to deal with him coming back like, Mom, look, look at all these baby crocodiles I found. Oh, they weren't baby crocodiles. <laughs> Remember, Steve Irwin had a reputation for going after the ones that, you know, were had already proven to be a menace to society. So, you know, the ones that ate, the, that ate so, your pets. So, or, wait, 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 wait. Let me clarify this real quick, okay? He's just got, like, one on a so, leash that's, good, so that's named Mittens. What you're saying is Steve Irwin started the first crocodile penal colony. Oh where my he kept God. bringing in all of the worst offenders <laughs> and housed them in one spot. <laughs> Personally, I think he was just trying to recreate the scene from that one, like, 70s Bond movie where James Bond has to run across all the crocodiles in order to escape from the island. Oh, <laughs> the crocodile pit. Yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, Steve Irwin takes over the park in 1991, and he rebrands it as the Australia Zoo in 92. Fair. That's a smart uh, move. Yeah. This is where uh, he lays down the mission of conservation through exciting education. Uh, he expands its size rapidly. And uh, the big reason for his expansion was that Steve wanted to provide uh, natural habitats for all the animals on display. Um, this is a shift in zoo culture. Traditional zoos consisted of a concrete box big enough for the animal to turn around in uh, that people could view the animal from the outside of. Uh, Steve Irwin, being a conservationist, wanted to take the existing landscape and tailor it to the individual needs of his animals. Um, you know, mo most zoos uh, would follow suit, uh, but you know, it would take time uh, to transit for most places around the world to transition away from the uh, starving beast in metal box format. And I mean, zoos have... he did a he did a good he did a lot of work to like setting setting a new example for zoos because now like. Nowadays, you often see, like, research stations associated with uh, zoos as well. And not to yeah. mention, this was one of the big pioneers in zoo enrichment. Now, almost every zoo focuses on animal enrichment, ways that they can improve the habitat, improve the quality of living for the animals, and make sure that they're not actually suffering. The Steve, as a whole, was one of the primary figures, one of the more prominent ones of trying to accommodate the, the terrain and the local habitat to the animal versus, like Colm said, using them in concrete boxes. Yeah. And um, uh, that also kind of ties in to the, um, the massive growing of Australia Zoo. Because one of the things that um, ended up happening is after he rebranded and after all the movies and shows came out, 
the zoo began expanding. He took all the, well, not all, but a good portion of the funds he made from the show and used it to build up the zoo even more. You could tell that was his passion project. I mean, he expanded uh, initially to 16 acres, another doubling in 550 animals by 2000. Technically, that was a quadrupling because he inherited only a four-acre zoo. <laughs> and then, yet s- seven years later, so slightly post-mortem for him, unfortunately, yeah. the zoo expanded to 80 acres and over a thousand animals by 2007. And we don't have this in the project notes here. Current? Oh, yeah, you do at the bottom. Um, yeah, yeah. The uh, it uh, jumped to like the current stuff. Yep. Yeah. Which the. That was in 2007. It was 80 acres, up from the original four acres. Now, in 2024, the zoo is over 700 acres. Yeah. This is bigger than anything Steve could have dreamt of. Yeah, with a total of 500 permanent staff members, uh, as opposed to the very first two all the way back in in, uh, the 1980s. I, this is one of the sad things I, I truly find, because I genuinely wonder what his thought would be on this. I'm sure he'd be thrilled. I'm sure he'd be over the moon with it, but I just would love to see how proud he is, because you know his his wife, Terry, and the kids, they have spent their hard blood, sweat, and tears to, to continue this and to grow this project and to continue that legacy, and it, it's... You see so much negativity in the world, and you see so much negativity with celebrities. To see news like this of just good, wholesome people, it's yeah, it's uh, beautiful. Yeah, and speaking of the wholesomeness, uh, one of the things that uh, Steve Irwin establishes is in 2004, uh, he puts together the Australia Zoo Wildlife Hospital. Uh this hospital he dedicates to his mother after her passing in 2000. She had passed four years prior. And um, what had started out as a avocado packing shed that had been converted into like an emergency uh, room for some of the animals that lived at the zoo, uh, he transformed into a major hospital. Uh, the hospital itself... Uh, rescues, rehabilitates, and releases an average of 7,000 Australian animals every year. So, you know, he, he, went, he went from literally a... He went from literally a converted shed to a hospital that handles 7,000 patients. That's absolutely insane. Which... It, so, here's some statistics directly from the Wildlife Warriors website. They oh, right. estimate that over a 12-month period... Nine to ten thousand animals are brought to the hospital for life-saving treatment, and over the course of its lifespan, from two thousand four up until two thousand twenty-two, they have admitted over one hundred and twenty thousand animals. Forty-five percent are birds, fifteen percent are possums or gliders, sixteen percent are reptiles, six percent are koalas, and four percent are bats. So this is truly a a remarkable figure and i know post 2020 after the bushfires they took on a significantly larger uh, amount of animals like they they started putting animals just anywhere they could find space just to try and care for them mm-hmm. just, i remember that oh it was heartbreaking yeah yeah and uh that, uh, that does bring us to our last point, which uh, following Steve Irwin's death in 2006, his wife, Terry Irwin, uh, took over ownership of the zoo. And she, uh, I believe she still owns it to this day, though uh, um, his, <clears throat> ah, sorry about that throat there. Uh, though I believe his son uh, does a lot of the uh, day-to-day management uh, with the, uh, you know, of the zoo. Also, his father, Bob, helps run the zoo. He works, it, operates it, although I'm not sure if he's fully retired yet, but I know he also took up roles in management. And yet, yeah, Robert does great work. I mean, the whole Irwin family, they actually have a TV show that's on the air now, and one of the things that I find incredible is, like I said, they continue his legacy. There's videos of comparisons of Robert doing the crocodile shows like his dad did. 
and it's just he's a spitting image of him. He shares the same enthusiasm. Um, Robert was on one of those late night talk shows, bringing in a bunch of animals. And I think it was with Jimmy Fallon, and Jimmy was just like, "Wow, you you really embody your dad's spirit." He's also got a TikTok. I found his TikTok a few times. Yes, highly highly recommend following him. Uh, Bindi Chandler, their whole family, like. And the fact that Bindi also found an American and who moved to Australia and it started working at the zoo, like, you just, you love to see it. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, this is a little bit of a lighter episode, thankfully, not as dark. It's still a tragedy that we lost Steve Irwin, but when you talk about someone who has had such a massive impact, like, this is going to have generational impacts. And... I know we usually shy away from the shocking statements, the over the top, but I think it's safe to say, like, this is truly someone who is once in a generation. Yeah, I'd say so, too. Also, when have we shied away from being uh, from being direct about things? I mean, that's kind of like half our brand is we were going to say what we mean. Okay, most of our, like, shit talking, though, happens with the British Museum. Yeah. Very rarely do we go after individuals, and usually we shy away from really controversial individuals. Yeah, fair enough. But still, we got to talk about Steve Irwin here and his zoo. <laughs> yeah, so highly recommend checking out all of their stuff. If there's any topics you'd like to see us covered, because I think that's a good wrapping up point here. We put a li nice little bow tie in. Um, highly recommend checking out the Wildlife Warriors Project. If you have a few extra dollars to spare, it's always worth donating to them. Um, just un unpaid solicitation. I mean, that they, they do great work. If you can't tell, we all have a massive respect for everything that they're doing there. Uh, yeah. But if you guys enjoyed watching, let us know. If there's a topic you'd like to have us cover, let us know. Thank you for listening, and we will see you next week with a uh, very, very fun topic. We're going to be talking about the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. Also visit your state parks. Yes. Two weeks, by the way. Two weeks, sorry. Yes. Thank you, guys. We'll see you.